Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome, and thanks for joining us uh, for Vote 08, an Iowa perspective. It's a conversation among Iowa Press journalists that normally are on the Iowa Press program, and we've gathered them here tonight before uh, an audience, and we're really pleased that you could join us, and we're going to be seeking some questions from you as we go along with the discussion. We're going to be hearing tonight uh, from Mike Glover, who's a senior political writer for the Associated Press and one of our Iowa Press regulars. Kay Henderson, who is Radio Iowa's news director. Kay spends a lot of time at the State House and traveling around Iowa covering the political candidates. Indeed. And David Yepsen, political economist for the Des Moines Register. Well, Senator Obama was scheduled to be in Des Moines two days from the time that we're having this discussion. He has canceled because of a family illness and canceled other campaign events. Does that also say this close to the election that he feels fairly comfortable, Mike? I think there's a, a certain comfort level in the Obama campaign. I, th I think right now, uh, nationally, I think if you average the polling, he's five or six points ahead. Uh, that's a fairly comfortable lead with under two weeks to go. So I think there is some reason for comfort in the Obama campaign. But I think the other thing it does is it, it puts a really interesting spin on the campaign. He's going to go off the campaign trail uh, for a couple of days visiting a sick, aged grandmother who helped raise him. Uh, and McCain has been fairly sharp recently. He's had the chainsaw out. Uh, does he continue to chainsaw Barack Obama, who's in Hawaii with a sick grandmother? I don't know if that's the way to endear yourself to a lot of voters around the country who may be coming to a conclusion right now. That looks fairly mean-spirited. On, on the other hand, there are less than two weeks to go, uh, and he's behind. Yeah. He's got to do something. It puts, if anything, McCain in a real bind. Okay, the McCain already, Senator McCain already, though, has, uh, among some voters, say they just don't like the negative campaigning, Mike calls it chainsaw, mm -hmm. is it going to make any difference at this point? Does he really have to go ahead with uh, the very harsh criticism? Well, I expect John McCain to be back to Iowa, frankly, before election day because it's clear that Iowa is among the states that they still think may be part of their electoral college map. Who's the they? The McCain, McCain campaign. Yes, yeah. uh, it, it, indeed, McCain has been here three times since his nominating convention. Obama has not been here at all. I think the Obama campaign actually surprised some of us in the political community by scheduling a visit to Iowa this week in advance of the caucuses because we've been looking at polling data for Iowa specifically that shows Obama with a sizable lead here. But as you look at the Electoral College map and states which George Bush won in 2004, Iowa is in that column of states that the McCain look, campaign looks to and hopes to maybe turn things around. Dave, do you, do you sense any sort of, the, the lead in the poll seems to be widening. Is that the way that you're reading just the mood? Well, I think Obama's ahead. McCain has been closing. Uh, now in the last couple of days, Obama has moved back up. I think you have to be careful about using polls as a predictor. Uh, a lot of people did that four years ago and uh, and they came a cropper for doing it because uh, polls are not predictors. Uh, there are two wild cards in this race. Race, does Barack Obama's race hurt him? Is there a bigot vote out there that's going to not show up at the polls or vote against him? And the second is young voters. Will they show up? So those are kind of two wild cards that pollsters mm -hmm. think they've got a handle on. They think they've been able to, to figure that out, but they don't know for sure. It's part of what makes this interesting uh, election historic. Uh, so I, I, I'm okay. I'm, I'm not sure quite what Obama was doing here in Iowa. Uh, to begin with. I mean, he's clearly ahead in this state by everybody's measure. I do think probably it was made up maybe a bit of a head fake to try to keep McCain from uh, spending, uh, from pulling out completely as he's done in some other states. Yeah, Over I the think, weekend. I think ahead, it's Mike. interesting. There's an old saying in sports that uh, the race doesn't always go to the swift and the strong, but that's the way to bet. The elections doesn't, don't always go to those who are ahead in the polls, but that's the way to bet. Mm -hmm. I was in the St. Louis area over the weekend, and uh, Senator Obama held a rally there at the Arch. I was struck by uh, a photo that was on the front page of uh, the paper in that area. At, uh, at, at the reason I was struck by it, because it reminded me of another photo that we see so often. 
it was the back of Senator Obama looking out over an endless sea of people that John McCain could have only envied that he would have had at his rally. And it reminded me of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King on the uh, steps of the Lincoln Memorial with that famous speech of his, uh, I Have a Dream. And the headline under it, Obamania. Do you sense, is that the mood that are we getting into? Uh, is it issues driving it or is it emotion? It's always emotion. Elections are almost never about issues. Elections are about emotion and an emotional attachment to a candidate. Uh, Obama has, has in some areas been able to build that into huge campaign crowds. The 100,000 that Barack Obama put in St. Louis on that day you're talking about was the largest rally of the campaign to date. The second largest rally of the campaign to date was 75,000 in Portland, Oregon that Barack Obama Obama put there. Uh, yeah, he, he's managed to connect with people on that sort of emotional level. He's got an intangible. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but he's got it. And when, it walks, when he walks into the room, there's that connection. So yeah, he's he struck on an emotional uh, level. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure, I think he's probably on the right side on, on a lot of the issues, but he's made that emotional connection. One of the points that David made about younger voters, I think is worth discussing a little bit. Younger voters heretofore haven't participated very well in elections, especially in Iowa, a state which has a predominantly elderly population that turns out um, election after election. But one of the reasons Barack Obama did well in the Iowa caucuses back on January 3rd is because younger voters turned out in greater numbers than before. Um, there's a University of Iowa poll out today that showed some fairly interesting things about the younger voter. One, they pay close attention to the polls, which I found fascinating. And number two, they don't pay very much attention to issues. So they are motivated by what Mike was discussing, um, the aura of a candidate, the feel that they have with that candidate. And that's one of the things that's been most fascinating to me as I've covered uh, politics for the past two decades is, is many voters make a decision with their heart, not with their mind. Yeah, and delve a bit deeper into what you're saying there, Kate. Are you at all saying herd mentality, watching the polls, seeing what everybody else is doing, I will too? Uh, you know, maybe it's peer pressure. I don't know, but, but I found that interesting uh, that that uh, younger voters are very concerned about polling data. You know, Obama always has done well with younger voters. It still wasn't enough to save him in some pretty important primaries in some big states. So while we're all interested in what we call the millennial vote, the under 25 mm -hmm. voter, um, you know, that's not going to be enough for him to win. This uh, Iowa is one of the oldest states in the country. He's yeah. going to have to get get some more someplace else. And I think he's been able to do that if if you believe, looking at this polling data, that he's got a pretty good, uh, a pretty good lead here. But while we're all interested in young voters, Gene, it's, it's by far it's not the whole game for it. And, and you, the thing you mentioned is one of the most basic uh, components that go into an electoral decision. It's something that drives candidates crazy. Voters don't like to waste their vote on someone they think is going to lose. One of the strongest attractions that a candidate has is the perception that that candidate is going to win. Mm -hmm. That's why candidates spend a lot of their campaign time mm -hmm. trying to convince us and everybody Everybody else, they're the candidate that's going to win because that automatically attracts that slice of the middle of the road electorate that's driving force for them is they want to win and they want to be with the winner. And you mentioned, you mentioned Dean, you know, is it issues, is it him? I think it's, it, it's a little of both. I think at, at one level, it, Barack Obama is uh, a history making figure. Uh, and so there's some interest there He's a, for biracial candidate. Uh, so I think all voters are more interested in that because just because of it, it's something we've not seen before. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a little bit of that with Sarah Palin. I mean, we've not seen a, a, a woman running for the vice presidency before. But it's also about issues. Uh, I mean, things are not going well in America. The right track, wrong track numbers are, are through the roof. President Bush is probably one of the most unpopular presidents in our nation's history. So in that sense, it is about issues. It's about a war that most people don't think should have been fought. It's about a debt that's going through the, uh, the roof. It's about people worrying about their jobs and their savings. And those very much are issues. And, and so I think at some t some, sometimes, Dean, I think we just grind it too fine. Things are tough. The party that's in power is going out, and the party that's out of power is going in. And that's, we need to say no more. And we'll, we'll, there, we'll look back a couple of weekends ago at a real landmark uh, point in this campaign. It was a point at which, and, and the McCain staff was you know, telling reporters this, 
Uh, we think that our campaign, which has been based on, uh, we're more experienced than Barack Obama, we're a legitimate national hero, uh, he has no legitimate international experience, we're the stronger, better candidate to govern America in a tough world. What they said, and they told every reporter covering them, we've decided that's not working. We've decided the whole thrust of our campaign ain't going to get us there. So we're going to have to reverse direction and start using the term I use to chainsaw the guy. Well, given that they read the same polls we do, maybe that was a decision they were forced to make. But that was a decision that makes his campaign path very difficult. And it, it, excuse me, it, it just it rings hollow, Dean. Uh, you know, the, the Republicans talk about William Ayers. Um, you know, it's, it's just irrelevant to the daily lives of most people right now. And Senator McCain has suffered because his image he used to have a pretty a maverick image. Now his image is that is sort of this grouchy old man, and it's a very negative image that's setting up on him. Uh, it's almost as if you kind of wish for the John McCain of 2000. But by doing what Mike was talking about here, he's really uh, off the mark in terms of uh, the issues that are driving a lot of voters. And plus, he's had some other mistakes. I mean, I think the Palin choice has turned out to, to be a, a mistake. It was initially a positive with uh, the base of the Republican Party, but most voters now don't see her as uh, capable of handling the presidency. And and also his his erratic behavior when the uh, during the during the economic meltdown. Uh, those are a couple things that I think have kind of turned this against him. Let's and go with the economic meltdown then, Kay, and I, I hope that that's what you were going to say, and if not, just uh, say it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the econ what was that the albatross that really dragged and turned around the McCain campaign into uh, 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 double digit losses? I, I think Iowans who had a chance to observe candidates campaigning for the Iowa caucuses understood that Barack Obama was a cool customer, that he sort of had a calm about him as he dealt with the campaign. He wasn't really white hot. Um, he didn't show temper in public. And I don't think it was until that economic crisis and you saw John McCain saying one thing at the start of the day about the fundamentals of the economy being strong, and then by the end of the day saying, you know, a fruit basket upset essentially, uh, that people got a sense that here is a guy who shoots from the hip and maybe I'm uncomfortable at this moment in time with a guy who shoots from the hip. One other factor here in Iowa, and Kay's comment made me think of this, Barack Obama has a real advantage in Iowa because of the caucuses. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unique in, 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 around the country because he spent the better part of a year in this <laughs> state uh, building an infrastructure here. In the, in the two years prior to the Iowa caucuses, Barack Obama spent exactly twice as much time in Iowa as John McCain. McCain was in Iowa and then he was out, but, but Obama was everywhere in a lot of towns, a lot of islands got to see him up close. Uh, he built a, a, a wonderful campaign infrastructure and organization that's really uh, unprecedented in organizational politics in this state, and that is still paying dividends for him. And that's especially important in Iowa because Iowa is a small retail state. It's a state where voters expect to see, reach out, and touch their, cam their candidates mm -hmm. and ask them questions. Mm -hmm. And they had a year to do that with Barack mm -hmm. Obama. They didn't really have a year to do that with John McCain. And the, the Palin factor that you mentioned, I often tell a story that uh, I, I relate that back to the health club I attend, which is one of the most Republican places in America. It's older, it's white men, basically. Uh, white men who like to play basketball and are too old to do it. Uh, so this is a pretty Republican place, and I was sitting in a steam room with a couple guys, looked to be about 70, and one of them said to the other, you know, I, I like that John McCain guy, he's a, he's a good guy, but you know, he's older than I am. And the other guy said, yeah, you're right, and you know what, he gets elected, he, something happens to him if he gets elected, she's president. What's that all about? That, I think, mm -hmm. is at the bottom line, the damage he's done to that ticket. That yep. seems to be showing up, too, in the poll comments, that, that the very thing that you've just mentioned. Sure. However. Doesn't it also show also that, uh, haven't you been hearing Republicans saying she is our future and uh, that she's going to be around and more of an influence in the Republican Party in the future than John McCain? Well, she may be, Dean, except what I wonder with Sarah Palin is if she hasn't uh, been Dan Quayleized. <laughs> in other words, when Dan Quayle was rolled out and just fell flat in 1988, he never recovered from that. And when he tried to run for president on his own, he, his image had taken such a beating. 
uh, that it was impossible for him to recover. So when I hear Republicans talk about, gee, Sarah Palin will be our future, uh, fine, but she's got a, a, a tremendous amount of damage control to do, and I'm not willing to say that uh, she's, gonna, she's got a great future right now until uh, I see how she handles that damage. Because I, I think at the end of the day, this is all going to come down to be being between John McCain and Barack Obama. That's who's going to decide this election, and Sarah Payne will be an afterthought. If she runs on her own, then she'll be the central focus, and all this stuff will come back to haunt. Okay. And back to the caucuses, and I'll ask David to chime in here. The, the Iowa poll that your paper recently did had a very uh, small number of undecided voters. Was it something like 5 percent? Am yeah, I correct pretty, on that? Yeah. I'm convinced those people probably aren't going to, to vote, mainly because Iowans have been engaged in this campaign for two years. They've already made their minds up. As I go out and speak with Iowans, they're frankly tired of the campaign. They want it to be old, over. A lot of them are voting mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. and, and so I don't mm -hmm. see that um, a McCain can turn it around here in a way that he might be able to turn it around in another state of the same size that hadn't been engaged in the campaign for two years. Part of Sarah Palin's problem is what you just described, and you have Republicans who say she's our future. She fires up the base. Well, the term base implies that you build something more on top of it. And John McCain has fired up his base, but what's he added to that? Mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't. And I don't think other Republicans are going to automatically cede a 2012 fight to uh, uh, Sarah Palin. It's interesting, Dean, we're, we're, we're already talking about 2012 in mm -hmm. Iowa. Uh -huh. But you know what? That's not <laughs> reporters doing it. Before, even before the election, guess who announced he was coming to Iowa? Yeah. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal is coming at the end of November. Now, what's that all about? I think it's about 2012. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think the, the McCain people, and I don't want to be beating up on them, he is a, they have run a strong campaign and the thing's not over yet, uh, but I think they may have made a fundamental mistake and it goes back to the people around him. He is largely surrounded by George W. Bush's political advisors, people out of Karl Rove's shop. Uh, those are the people running his campaign and making strategic decisions. If you look at 2004, uh, George mm -hmm. W. Bush was able to make that a turnout game, mm -hmm. to, to say, say to John Kerry, I can turn out my base better than you can turn out your base. And by about 50,000 votes in Ohio, he was right. I think in some sense they're trying to run that same campaign again, but the numbers have changed. And the, the, the opening for McCain this time was with undecided voters. And, a, and his guy in Iowa was very wise about it. He says, if we turn out our base and they turn out their base, they win. The difference with 2004, Dean, is that in that election it was about war. It was about a commander-in-chief in wartime. This election is about the economy. Uh, John McCain can't really control that, but he, uh, I think, was counting on the fact that the conversation would be about winning a war and national security, which is his portfolio. It's shifted underneath him. Let's uh, talk just a little bit about issues. Um, is the issue health care? Iraq started out being the issue. McCain, polls show now that that's the only issue on which McCain holds even a slight edge. Health care and the economy are the issues now in the voters' minds. In fact, I did a, a, a little survey of just impromptu and non-scientific, but I did some interviews with uh, Eastern Iowans before the debates. What is it you want to hear from the candidates tonight? I was blown away, surprised by nearly everyone was naming health care and I thought it would be the economy yes they did mention the economy but almost to a person health care was right in there near well, the top it's part of the economy Dean uh, it's a pocketbook issue it's an issue for business owners and it's an issue for the people who are employed in those businesses. And people are scared too. And people are upset that they're um, going to lose their coverage. They're yes. upset with the coverage they have yes. and the experience they've had in a hospital or a yes. clinic regarding their bills. Um, and frankly, I've heard Republicans express uh, privately that they're hoping that somehow their party gets a way to advance on that issue in a way that Democrats have. Uh, most polling data that I've seen shows that uh, Democrats hold an edge on the health care issue rather than Republicans. And it may have tipped over a little bit as an issue because you're now, now it's, typically it's been sort of the liberal Democrats want to do health care, the Republicans say no, nah, that's the government taking over the health care system, and government run health care and all that. A new factor you're starting to see weigh in that is business. Uh, businesses are starting to say we can't compete 
uh, with Japan. We can't compete with European countries with a national health care system where they don't have to worry about health care. It's paid for. Uh, it's becoming not just a business issue, it's becoming an economic issue. And Kay's right. I don't think voters separate the two. But when I look at my, and I had this experience just the other day, uh, when I look at my 201K, uh, after what happened to the market, and I see uh, John McCain uh, talking about Bill Ayers, I'm thinking, what is this guy thinking about? Doesn't he realize that Americans are looking at savings going away, retirement being put off, mm -hmm. and they want to think about something that happened 40 years ago? Yeah. Has the campaign at all been influenced by the disparity in campaign spending? Barack Obama, unlimited. John McCain, yes. Yes. Yes, it has. I mean, you can't be outspent in any political campaign the way John McCain has been. Uh, and not have it have an impact. B Obama can do anything he wants, all of the above. He can play everywhere. McCain has to target his resources. And so it enables Obama to be, to compete in states that Democrats would ordinarily write off, like West Virginia. Uh, North Carolina. It, it, North Carolina. I mean, those are places that he's forcing McCain to defend. And the, the way you can tell this is going on is just look at where they're spending time. They're not spending time in states John Kerry carried four years ago. They're spending time in states that George W. Bush carried mm -hmm. uh, four years ago. And that tells you that, that Obama, with his resource advantage, is really taking the attack to McCain. McCain is mm -hmm. the, 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 the uh, McCain is back to the wall, to use a, a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And I, I recall at the time that uh, Obama announced back in June, he was pulling out of the public financing system, all the talking heads had a heyday. Oh, this guy's going to take a beating, he's flip-flop, he's going to open himself up as a flip-flopper. And uh, David Axelrod, who's the media guy and the, sort of the brains behind uh, Obama's operation, said at the time, we'll get a bad couple of days of press right now in early June about going back on our promise to do public financing. But guess what? When we're spending that money in October, nobody will remember that. And guess what? They're spending that money right now in October and nobody remembers that. Campaign spending is not a voting issue. Voters think all politicians are dirty when it comes to money. <laughs> so you get a few editorial writers and columnists like me who will cluck, cluck about it. But at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's just not a voting issue. This election is about anxiety and fear, and people are, are worried. And, and Obama has done a better job of addressing that concern uh, than McCain has. And Obama figured out something that Howard Dean wanted to do. He wanted to have the sort of online revolution and engage voters online. Well, many of Obama's uh, contributors are coming from online donations. And if they're investing five, 10, 15, 86 dollars, I think is an average donation online, uh, they're investing in a campaign in a way um, that I think is powerful for the Obama campaign in their eyes, because that's somebody who is investing in the candidate. And having said all that we've said up to this point, <laughs> um, I think one thing that Republicans ought to take comfort in is that we're not saying it's over. I mean, we, you haven't heard a lot of positive yeah. stuff yeah. out there about John McCain's campaign. I mean, the times are bad for Republicans. McCain has run a sometimes you know, questionable campaign. Uh, it's a bad environment. Why isn't this thing over? Yeah. In fact, he's still in it, and maybe he's the only Republican candidate out there mm -hmm. who would be alive at all at this point. A lot of people that Obama's yet to close the sale with. That's why in a lot of his numbers, we're all looking at the gap. You know, is it five point or eight points? But you also have to look at the fact that in some cases, Obama is right at 50 percent or below. He just hasn't been able to, to break through. Dean, if you want to watch for something that, uh, that can, can alter the, the trajectory of this race, it's unforeseen events. A terrorist attack, a national security disaster of some, time, of some kind. We all know that last minute events in a campaign can turn it. We've all seen campaigns that in the last 72 hours can switch on the basis of some surprise. So, yeah, there's, uh, this isn't over. Uh, I want to invite uh, our audience now to prepare for some questions. We, we hope that we've whetted your appetite here talking about the presidential race, but it's not limited to that. We're going to be talking about some Iowa politics here and the congressional races and the legislature too. So uh, if uh, you have a question, would you move to the microphone at this time? And uh, we'll take that question in just a moment. And, and while you're moving to the microphone, I want to move the discussion to Iowa and and say uh, we're, we're seeing maybe the start of a landslide nationally that could be a landslide for Obama and a Democratic landslide. Is it likely that that will carry through? Because I've heard each one of you say, in Iowa I'm talking about, each one of you say politics is local and not necessarily does it mean that uh, a, a Republican can't win. It could, Dean, and uh, here's how it works. I think we will we'll see it if first in Iowa if, if there is a real surge for, um, 
for Obama. We'll see it in the fourth district race uh, where Becky, the Democrat Becky Greenwald is challenging Tom Latham. Uh, she's a, she's a, a formidable candidate, uh, but, but Latham has got a lot more money, and what uh, the Greenwald people are counting on is that there is this surge of new support out there uh, for Obama that will also vote for her. So that's an example of, of where it can have an impact. Mm -hmm. It's also true that Tom Latham is not asleep. He's working very hard. Incumbents tend to get reelected in right. Iowa. So it may be, it may prove the point that, that Obama could win Iowa comfortably, but really not have uh, coattails. And you can, Democrats themselves will point to the obvious comparisons about the national electorate going one way and the legislative elections in particular going another way. In 1992, Bill Clinton beat H.W. Bush and won the White House. In 1992, Democrats lost the Iowa House. In 1996, Bill Clinton got reelected. In 1996, Democrats lost the Iowa Senate. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll argue there aren't many coattails out there. If they're coattails, they're pretty darn short. And they're also hoping that history repeats itself. <laughs> well, and some, go ahead. Well, one indicator that I see in legislative races came from House Republican leader Christopher Rantz, who devised a strategy essentially admitting that the change argument at the national level the Democrats from Obama on down to congressional candidates are articulating is a change message that he embraced. If you want change, let's change Washington <laughs> and Des Moines. I so I think that's an indication that the change message is really powerful among voters this year. It's, it's possible that an Obama surge in some areas would would help Demo down ballot Democratic candidates. I'll give you an example: uh, the legislative district that includes Grinnell, uh, Danny Carroll, and Eric Palmer have been going at each other for about four years over there. <laughs> uh, and you know, if, if Barack Obama uh, is able to to turn out 500 to 1,000 more students in Grinnell for the Democratic ticket, that will help the Democrat mm -hmm. Eric Palmer. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of where mm -hmm. it it might help uh, yeah. on the margins in a close race yeah. a little yeah. bit. Oh, I think we have a question. Hi. Um, hi. Did I'm going to go ahead and, my name's Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drag that big elephant out, um, just from what I've been hearing. Republican elephant? Um, no. Um, <laughs> the race element uh -huh. of this, because um, I really think that it's going to come down to that for some people. I think people are going to do what we accuse our, our politicians of doing, say one thing and do another. People, we know people gravitate towards what they know. So I'm just curious, especially with Iowa being a predominantly Caucasian state and other states, um, and with McCain going at the fear factor of he's different, he's not like us, and almost treating us like we're stupid, <laughs> um, which we aren't, how much of an effect that is going to have because we're at such a heightened fear and scare about the economy and where we're going and the changing of things that are going on in the world. I before, think before Dave answers, you said treating us like we're stupid. Who was the us? I mean us as in the American public. The underlying question is the African American population that is actually educated and intelligent and not what everybody gets a, to see. They don't see the intelligent part on a, on a regular basis. And Obama is showing that. But on the African American side of that, and my mother especially, because she's of the older age, there are African Americans who say he's just not black enough. And, and that is something hard for me, since I have biracial children, for that to come out. But as a person brought up to thinking of people as people, mm -hmm. it's a problem for me. Um, I'm upset, because my rose-colored glasses have been yanked off. Well, do you think that uh, those African Americans who don't think that Barack Obama is black enough are not going to vote for him? Some won't. I, I, I'm, I'm betting on it just from what the conversation I've had with my mother. She definitely thinks he has better ideas, but that's still a craw for her. Well, and, it, and it's an argument we'll have for years, I'm sure. A <laughs> couple points in answer to your question. Number one, the, since the economy is bad, you know, I think in issues of black and white, green is more important. Uh, and I think that that has eclipsed some of these other tensions, some of these social issues. Uh, Republicans are out there talking about social issues, and they really are irrelevant. You know, I, I tell my NRA friends, you know, that the Second Amendment doesn't mean a whole lot if you can't afford the ammunition. And, and, and so I think some of that has trumped some of these social issues and social concerns. Secondly, there has been some research done. Uh, AP, Yahoo, and Stanford University did some extensive polling on this, and they concluded that 
about 6% of the white Democratic vote that should ordinarily go to a Democratic candidate will not be available to Barack Obama. And that in a national election, that could shave about two and a half points off his total. So with all the caveats about polling on race and how it's difficult to do and people lie to pollsters, you know, if you want to look at, if you want to discount some for that, you could take a point or two off Obama's total and just say it might not be there to materialize. I tend to think that it's already in there that it's already in the poll data, that people are, are saying they have other, they don't say, I'm not going to vote for a black guy. They say, he's not experienced enough, um, and, and things like that, that, that really are a way for them to, uh, to hide out. And finally, Obama does, I think, benefit from a larger African-American turnout. There are a lot of African-Americans in this country who are not registered to vote. There is evidence that he has inspired them to turn out and, and vote. Al Sharpton was doing turnout efforts in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Florida. Now, it works two ways. I mean, Obama may lose some because of his race, but he'll also pick up some because of it, too. Mike, and how I think volatile is that race? It's, it's very volatile, and, and the bottom line answer to your question is we don't know. And people like us are real reluctant to say we don't know. But a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, Dave, Dave is right. When you, you ask somebody, uh, are you going to vote for Barack Obama, a typical uh, person you would expect to be a Democratic voter, and they'll say, no, I'm not. And you'll say, why? And they'll say, well, because, because he's a Muslim, uh, which, of course, he isn't. Uh, because he doesn't have the experience, uh, which, you know, we can go back to John Kennedy and all that. Uh, because he's from Chicago. Uh, because it's out of that, you know, Chicago machine. What they're telling you is, I'm not going to vote uh, for Barack Obama because he's an African-American candidate. Uh, but the, the bottom line is, the, the polling that I've seen, and Dave's right, AP was in on some polls that did that, that he's going to lose some votes, some traditional Democratic voters, I'm thinking of West Virginia coal miners who traditionally vote Democratic because of his race, and that's going to be offset by a, an increase in turnout in younger voters, an increase in turnout in African-American voters. And that's going to be important because we forget in America we don't have a national election. It, in 2000 taught us that. Remember Al Gore, President Gore? He got more votes than George Bush. Uh, but you have to, it's a state-by-state state election. You have to get to 270. And in awfully important states that Obama needs, I think it's going to be an end for him. Elizabeth, while we have someone else move to the microphone, I'm going to follow up with your question and ask Kay, what effect did Obama winning the Iowa caucuses have on this race factor? Anything at all? It had a huge effect. He, he wanted to win in Iowa because it's a state that's, a, you know, at least 90% white. He wanted to show the world and the continent that we are settled on here that he could win in a white state. That was very important here. Um, it, it wasn't until the end of the campaign that he actually engaged the black community in cities in Iowa uh, like Waterloo and Des Moines. It wasn't until the very end of the campaign that he began engaging them actively to participate in the caucuses for that reason. He wanted to win in a white state. Um, and, and back to the previous question, just br very briefly. Um, Voting decisions are really complex, and you can't make them simplistic in that I'm going to vote for him because he's black or I'm going to vote against him because um, he's black. I remember having a conversation at the Republican National Convention with a woman who was very excited about Sarah Palin because all of those women who supported Hillary Clinton are going to vote for Sarah Palin. And so I said, so did you vote for Walter Mondale? And she got a very strange look on her face. It had escaped her mind that Geraldine Ferraro was on the ticket with Walter Mondale. And she could have, she just never thought about voting for Walter Mondale. So even though there are a section of voters that will make that decision based on race, I think the voting decision is way too more complex. Quick than that. comment. Two quick points. Uh, it was important. His victory here was important. It was important to him psychologically to win in front of a largely white electorate. But it did move numbers in South Carolina because mm -hmm. a, uh, an African, a heavily African American electorate was wondering about Barack Obama. Can he win? Can he carry white votes? He proved that he could. And secondly, regardless of the outcome of this race, 
uh, on November 2nd. We're going to have a discussion about race in this country. It is a very difficult topic to talk about. It's very sensitive. It's charged with all kinds of sensitivities and, and political correctness. But we're either going to have a discussion about has America made progress because he wins or what are the impediments still there if he loses. We're going to have a discussion about race relations. And one of the important things about the Iowa caucuses was we forget this. We have short memories sometimes. Up until Iowa, Hillary Clinton was the presumptive Democratic nominee all through the summer, all through the fall, all up into the winter, just before the caucuses, the assumption was Hillary Clinton uh, was going to be the eventual nominee. Then she to, conducted her Iowa campaign that way. And she conducted her Iowa campaign that way, which <laughs> sometimes <laughs> you can learn a lot about campaigns from losing campaigns. Exactly. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for being here this evening. And, uh, you know, I wish I had asked my question first because oh. hers was such a winner and, and, <laughs> and, and, and triggered such great discussion. It has left me very little room to maneuver, and I have no good follow up. Um, <laughs> however, um, my observation in the last, throughout this campaign mm -hmm. and in the last year, has been that our national media, and I'm talking the national broadcasters, not the uh, print media so much. Has so you guys are off the hook. You guys are off the hook. <laughs> has been absolutely <laughs> impotent when it comes to asking tough questions of the candidates and really getting at the core of what's important about these issues because CNN loves to ask questions of the campaigns. Well, honestly, who cares? Who cares what someone who, by the McCain campaign or the Obama campaign, who's paid to say nice things about them, <laughs> is going to say? And meanwhile, it's our comedians who seem to be asking the tough questions. We have Jon Stewart, we have Stephen Colbert. We're reliant on David Letterman to say to John McCain, maybe it's not such a good idea for you to be pointing out the Obama heirs connections when you are personal friends with G. Gordon Liddy. And over on The View, we have a host who gets in McCain's face and says, you know, some of these ads you've been running are lies. And suddenly she's being hailed as the next Edward R. Morrow of broadcasting <laughs> only because she asked a tough, fair question. So my question through all that is, yeah. do you agree that with my observation that our national broadcast media seems largely toothless compared to the comedians? Let me ask, and what will it take to reverse that? Let me ask a yes. quick question of you. Yes. Do you say that also, uh, think that also says something about the electorate to whom they're appealing? Possibly, but I, I, I think it just, you know, the thing is, the, the comedians do certainly have an advantage of being kind of irreverent, and that's going to appeal to the younger crowd who, you know, has always latched onto the likes of Saturday Night Live. All right. so, so partly it's that they are playing to their audience, but it is, it is my genuine observation that they are willing to ask tough questions, and I, I don't know if it's that they're afraid that if they start asking tough questions, then the candidates won't be on their show and will go over to some other network. But what we saw with Katie Couric and Sarah Palin was you know, fairly a remarkable interview, and yet that's the exception. That's not the rule. I, I, mostly they're just pumping out this sanitized nonsense, and I think the younger crowd is gravitating towards um, Jon Stewart, Stephen Colbert, because they ask tough questions and they get at the heart of matters. You're not, you're, you're, you're not gonna get me to defend broadcasters, but I would point out <laughs> that two of the, the biggest problems uh, Sarah Palin has had are named Katie Couric and Charlie Gibson. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, because they did ask mm -hmm. uh, tough questions, and more or less, she was coming off the glow coming out of the Republican convention. Mm -hmm. And those two interviews largely took the glow off the Palin candidacy. Yes. Yeah. And so I, I, I won't defend Kay's industry, <laughs> but. <laughs> what do you think, Kay? Um, I think the 24-7 news cycle has created great challenges for the 27, 24-7 uh, purveyors, that being the cable television channels. They have to fill that time and they often fill it with people talking at one another that, rather than with one another. But as Mike pointed out, we have competent journalists who have asked these people questions and have written stories that have aired on uh, television networks. Frontline just did a, an, an extraordinary piece that aired last week regarding the backgrounds of both Barack Obama and uh, John McCain. So, I would argue that in the news buffet that's out there, you have choices among news outlets that you can choose that are asking the tough questions. But as Mike said, it's hard to ask questions of someone who won't sit down for an interview. Um, it's been pointed out that John, um, that uh, Joe Biden hasn't done an interview for about a month. He's been doing a lot of, of campaign rallies, but he hasn't done an interview for a month. Um, during the caucuses. Possibly, but honestly, when I get on YouTube, there are a billion John Biden interviews. So, I, I mean, 
Maybe he hasn't done it in the last month, but he's, he's done plenty, certainly. Dave Yepsen? I think there's some truth to what you say, but I, but I, I also think that you might be painting with a little bit too broad of a brush. Uh, the, the comedians, the satirists, they have a, a different role. Um, and I do think there have been tough questions asked uh, of, of the candidates. I mean, I'm thinking of the different, you know, Russert's interviews. I've taken, you know, Chris Wallace on when he gets them on Fox. But Kay's right. These people are not... Uh, inclined to expose themselves to those interviews uh, any more often than they have to because of what happened to uh, to Sarah Palin. Uh, Joe Biden hasn't been seen lately because they're afraid Joe Biden might be Joe Biden. And, and, <laughs> although, although I, I mentioned the Couric interview, although I, I can't quite, I mean, I thought Katie did a great job. But it almost came down to, frankly, Palin's disappointing answers than Katie was being a brilliant journalist. Because Katie's asking questions like, what magazines do right. you read? Not a particularly challenging question. It's the fact that Sarah but, couldn't answer. So again, I mean, a very telling interview, but I'm not sure. I can't decide how much Katie actually worked into that equation. It just fell into her lap. Well, I, th I think there, a lot of times it is those innocent questions that are very revealing and are very telling. Look, is the media, do the media people have problems? We all got them. I mean, and I can do this riff better than you can. Uh, so I'm not going to sit here and, and I don't want to sound defensive. There are a lot of things that media people do wrong. There are a few things we do right. Uh, I will just say this. There is more information out there about candidates today That's than true. in yeah. any other election in history. And if you are so inclined, it doesn't take much effort. Uh, to find what you need to make your decision. And that, that is the good news. That's it? true. And while someone else moves to the microphone, I'm going to follow up. But D Dave, did you have... I just wondered if he had oh, a... Were you, would you answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, basically. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, which is why when people say to me, I don't know who Barack Obama is or John McCain is, I am tempted to respond, mm -hmm. how can you not know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I often tell people who are critical of media, people say, fine, tell me a story. Tell me the question that you need asked. Tell me what you want to hear. And a lot of times people do come forward and say, you know, talk to them about this. Um, and what really, in the run-up to the caucus campaign, you're looking at three journalists. We do have some access to those right. candidates, and we can do that. And when someone else okay. moves to the microphone, yeah. thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll pose my question that I asked earlier of mm -hmm. him, and that is, does that also say something about what moves the American electorate? Dave, newspapers across the country are in trouble. And that means that people aren't going to newspapers for their news. They're going elsewhere. You've already alluded to it in saying we have a plethora of media sources from which to gain information today. It doesn't that say something about how these tough questions are being asked or not asked, Mike? Well, I think, I think it boils down to a fundamental change in the broadcast industry. I'm an old guy. When I grew up, there were three television networks and public television that you had to choose from. That meant all four of those outlets had to cater to a broad American electorate. Uh, now you've, you've got the balkanization of broadcast journalism. You've got uh, Fox News, which has figured out that if I can carve out a fairly small Republican-leaning uh, course of the uh, audience, I can make a buck. I can get by. CNN has figured out if they can uh, cater to a fairly small, left-leaning slice of the electorate, they can make enough money to get by. And so they tend to tailor their message to the American people. One of the most troubling things that I've seen in politics in my career is I think the public increasingly doesn't want to be told what the news is of the day. The American public increasingly wants to be told that their preconceptions are justified. They want to be told what they want to hear. I think, and I think that's a serious problem. And I think that since there are so many media outlets out there, this this uh, electorate has been chopped and diced into such small pieces that you know, I, I no one media is replacing another. We just add on to it. I know Americans who get their information about the political campaigns from the BBC. They like their coverage of American politics better than what right. uh, other. Uh, radio outlets are, are, are uh, offering. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think Mike has a good point that we're in, we're in danger of, of not being informed but simply having our biases reinforced. And that's why I always tell ideologues at one end of the political spectrum or the other, don't think with your heart, think with your head. If you're a liberal, watch Bill O'Reilly once in a while. Read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, if you're a conservative, watch Keith Olbermann once in a while. Uh, you know, get another side. It'll make you. It'll make you more astute. It'll make you more informed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Give us your name, please. Um, my name is Mary. Yeah. I'd like to hear your insights about the charges about voter fraud, registration fraud. Is this a real issue we should be concerned about? What's your take on it? Why does that concern you? That is, where are you thinking that that is a factor? 
Well, I've heard some charges that this may be an effort to, raising the issue of voter fraud may be an effort to suppress voter turnout. That's traditionally the way that's used, Mary. It's, it's a, a, you've heard charges mainly this time uh, from the Republican side uh, about voters going to the polls in places like Ohio, raising questions about the registration, uh, and, and Democrats feel that that is an effort to suppress uh, voter turnout. And in an election where the main thrust of the Democratic campaign has been to expand the electorate, uh, beyond the base of 2004 to bring new voters into the electorate. In, in many ways, Barack Obama's campaign is based on that philosophy of bringing a new American electorate to, into play. That's an effort, I think, to push back on that uh, effort. While saying that, any evidence of voter fraud, and I've seen none that frightens me at this moment, is something that needs to be looked into, but not two weeks before an election. It, it is a serious problem in parts of the country. Uh, I think those of us in Iowa, we tend to take for granted that elections are honest and they're well run and you know, they're clean. And, and we do have, we have fairly honest politics in this state and elections are efficiently run and it sort of comes as a shock to us when we see things like what happened in Florida and these allegations about what might be happening in Ohio. They've got to be investigated, they've got to be checked out. Um, I think there are other ways that are more effective at suppressing turnout uh, than just making the allegation of, of voter fraud. Um, and. You know, the, so, so I don't. I don't know that that's necessarily a worker. I, I just think it's. It's uh, Republicans are very nervous about what they see happening uh, in Ohio. They can see that there could be a tsunami hitting them, and they're getting very concerned that some of this is uh, uh, is, is going to bite them. Uh, it reminds me of something Michael Morrow, our Secretary of State, once told me when he was County Auditor here in, in Polk County, and he said, uh, "The auditors in Iowa have a prayer, and that is." Lord, I don't care who wins or loses, just let it be by a big margin. <laughs> and Dave, Dave makes a very important point about us, us in Iowa taking clean elections for granted. I was in Columbus, Ohio, the night of the Ohio primary, and as the results were flowing in, uh, it became apparent fairly early on that there were no results coming in from Cleveland. And if you're in an Ohio election, Cleveland's a fairly important city. And I said to my AP colleague from Columbus, I said, what's, what's going on in Cleveland? He said, what's well, Cleveland? You can't, you know, there's going to be, you know, two weeks of roiling around about what happened in Cleveland and there'll be lawsuits and fights and all that kind of stuff because that's Cleveland. They just expect it in many parts of the country. Thank you. And uh, we'll move someone else to the microphone in. And while uh, someone else is coming to the microphone, let me move the uh, question to the Iowa economy for a moment. Uh, you have, uh, at Iowa Press from time to time, expressed uh, um, some observations about John McCain and his stand on ethanol hurting him in Iowa. Mm -hmm. I ask you, do Iowa, is, is ethanol a great big issue among the broad Iowa electorate? I mean, I, I kind of have my doubts. Dave, you're shaking your yeah, head. No, I don't think so. I mean, Iowans don't go around with a checklist, okay, when they decide how to vote for president. It's much more of a gut level feeling uh, about their competence in, in the White House, all right? and. I think what ethanol and McCain's opposition to this is, does, is it tells a lot of rural Iowans he doesn't understand our part of the world. He doesn't get it. He doesn't, he doesn't see our concerns and, how, and our world view. I think it becomes mm -hmm. symbolic of, uh, of, of something else. And he's using it to make a point, a larger point, you know, that he's against pork and all that. But, you know, I, I, I just think it's, it's, it's something that's hurt him in the upper Middle West. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's not doing well in Minnesota. He's not doing well in Wisconsin. Uh, so I think that this has been one of those issues that has kept some people from saying, you know, McCain understands my problems. And I think, right. I think it's a problem for him because the, I don't see a road to 270 for John McCain without something in the upper Midwest. I mean, I, I don't think he can afford to just get wiped out throughout the Midwest, and he's in danger of doing that. And I think you're right, Dave. I think it's not that everybody worries about ethanol. I mean, how many of us are farmers? How many of us benefit from the, what that's done to corn prices? But it's largely symbolic, because that's an important issue in rural states, and he thumbed his nose at it. He thumbed his nose at it, I think, hoping to convince voters that he's a maverick, but it didn't sell that way in rural parts of the country. And it didn't, and rural parts of the country, on those kinds of influences, influence 
everybody. And I think Missouri is a more interesting state to look at how this plays in Missouri. Of course, Obama's going to do well in heavily Democratic areas like St. Louis and Kansas City. But the reason George Bush won Missouri last time around was because he did incredibly well in the farm regions of Missouri, in the upper part that uh, abuts Iowa and in the lower part that abuts um, Arkansas. One of the reasons that Missouri is uh, such a toss-up state is because McCain is not doing as well in farm country. And McCain went to Missouri a few weeks ago and talked about his opposition to farm subsidies. So it's not just ethanol. It's his opposition to farm subsidies. It's a, it's a constellation of things that get back to what David said. He doesn't understand how our economy works. Yes. And it's, it's, it's an economic issue again. And it may be, it may be the, the current farm policy, whether you like it or dislike it, America's farm policy right now is a result of about 60 years of fighting and compromise between mm -hmm. rural and urban. That's why mm -hmm. food stamps and nutrition programs are in the farm bill. Right. That's a result of years of compromise between various competing interests. And uh, a senator like Tom Harkin, who chaired the Agriculture Committee and helped write it, can say it's not perfect, but it's the best I can do. And it's the best I can sell all around the country. And in a marginal election, if you can peel off a few people on the margins, people who are involved in the ag community, that can make a huge difference in a state like Missouri where a poll show that it's sort of neck and neck there. Let me just, before we go to another question mm -hmm. from our uh, audience, uh, does the economy at all have an influence in who controls the Iowa legislature yes. this next time? Yes. Yes, Dave, you say? Um, I think after the race for president, which we spent most of our time today talking about, uh, the big battle in Iowa is the battle for the Iowa House of Representatives. Uh, the Republicans, Democrats control at 53 to 47. Republicans are trying mightily to try to take enough seats to grab that back. Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a battle of a serious consequence. I mean, it determines it really what the agenda is going to be in this state for, for the next two years going into the, 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 the 2010 election campaign. So I don't think we can gloss over it as an important political battle. And the economic anxiety out there that concerned people helps Democrats. I mean, it's political science 101. When hard times are around, people want some governmental activism, that tends to favor Democrats. When times are good, they tend to look at some of these other social issues, get government out of my life, and that helps Republicans. Get government out of my life until I need it. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Yes, give us your name and your question. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jackie. Um, you began the discussion talking about um, Iraq and how Senator McCain had hoped that that would become his issue. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, I have family members that travel a lot um, globally for their, you know, for their positions. They um, sense that there is an intense um, worldwide interest in this election um, over possibly any other presidential election, you know, maybe in the last 20 years or so. And I'm wondering from your focus as journalists, you know, do you hear from your colleagues globally? Um, I know during the Iowa caucuses, you know, we regular <laughs> Iowans um, do talk to them. Um, but what is, you know, what is the sense worldwide about uh, their view on this election? And the election per se or a rock as an issue? The, the election per se and perhaps how it will shape foreign policy. I see. I think, I think Jackie, it's, it's huge. I mean, I do hear from uh, foreign journalists, journalists from other countries, and, and we saw, I think, journalists from 32 countries who were in Iowa uh, during the caucus campaign. There is an enormous interest uh, around the world in what America does and does not do. And a lot of it right now is driven by Iraq. The world is not happy with us for the way that was uh, done. Uh, and so there's a, and, and they see it has an impact. I mean, our economy's uh, rough and, and bad. Their economy is, is rough and bad. So it becomes a, a, a bread and butter issue to them. So the answer to your question is, yes, there's a, there's a lot of interest. I dare say in some countries there are probably more people know more about the American election than a lot of Americans do. And I think you have to look no further than the, the largest crowd that Barack Obama turned out was 100,000 in St. Louis until you count the crowd he turned out in Berlin. Uh, all throughout his European trip, there was enormous interest 
uh, in this candidate, in part because I think worldwide uh, he's viewed as a candidate of change, and uh, Senator McCain is viewed as a candidate who, as much as he talks about change, is likely to continue American policies for the large part that are not terribly popular in the rest of the world. Now, George Bush is fond of saying that we don't need to worry about what the rest of the world thinks. We need to worry about America's interests first. Jackie, but that doesn't I, sell well. Thank you. Thank you. Kay, okay, I'm going to interrupt because we're coming to the end of our time, and oh. I have one more question again. Thank you for it. Interesting and for helping us think globally. I want to get us back to Iowa as we close here, though. Uh, Chet Culver, our governor, isn't on the ballot this time, but he will be in two years. <laughs> that is, and I'm wondering how has he been performing uh, and how is his standing as you sense the mo mood of the electorate now? Uh, governor Culver's position is not as strong as he'd like it to be. His job approval runs anywhere from 55 to 60 percent, depending upon whose numbers you're looking at. Uh, that's not uh, great. It's okay. Uh, he's got a problem with the labor movement. He's got to heal up. They've had a big fight over uh, chapter 20 and, and right to work issues. Um, and, and so I think he's got to heal that up. He's got to produce on the the flood, uh, but the economy goes bad. It, it, it may not, we, we may not be coming out of this by 2010, uh, and it could hurt him as well. Uh, I think, Dean, if 2008 is a good year for um, Democrats, and they take the White House and Congress by big margins, that means 2010 is going to be a tough year for Democrats. The party in power in Washington oftentimes has a bad year uh, outside, and so I think Governor Culver and his people are worried about uh, about 2010. And it's buyer's remorse. And that happens, uh, you can look at history. 1992, Bill Clinton won the White House. What happened in 1994? Republicans took Congress. There was a huge Republican wave. It's called buyer's remorse, and it's going to backlash if this is a good Democratic year, as I think we all indicate. We think it looks at this point like it is. Okay. Um, two years is a is a huge amount mm -hmm. of time in politics. A lot could happen between now and then. Right now, it doesn't look like there's any leading Republican candidate to go up against a guy who's going to have the ability to raise yeah. a lot of money. But you know, at this point in time, back in 1998, we all thought we were going to have uh, Governor Lightfoot because we had never heard very much about Tom mm -hmm. Vilsack. Yep. It's and a, circumstances. The oldest, <laughs> the oldest rule in politics, Dean, is is you can't be somebody with nobody. And so if you want to talk about Governor Culver and whether he's in trouble or not, the question that Kay asks is, is the correct one. Who they got. And, and the interesting thing will be, and I was told by a very prominent Republican, former gubernatorial candidate, uh, that there's going to be a bloodletting in the Republican Party fairly quickly after this election if this is the way it plays out. Mm -hmm. And that bloodletting is hard to say. There are going to be a lot of moderate Republicans who are going to say, we gave the right wing the party. Look what happened to us. So we'll see how that plays out. And we're going to, with that bit of mystique, we're going to have to, uh, and projection into the future, we're going to have to say that our time is up. Thank you so much for your questions. And it's been very nice to have you in on this discussion around this. We don't have the kitchen table here, but it's been a kitchen table discussion, and we call it Vote 08. I'm Dean Borg, and on behalf of the journalists who've been responding here to the questions tonight, Dave Yepsen of The Register, Kay Henderson of Radio Iowa, Mike Glover of the Associated Press, I'm Dean Borg, and thanks for joining us.